I'm Travis Bader, and this is the Silver Core Podcast. Join me as I discuss matters related to hunting, fishing, and outdoor pursuits with the people and businesses that comprise the community. If you're new to Silver Core, be sure to check out our website, www.silvercore.ca, where you can learn more about courses, services, and products that we offer, as well as how you can join the Silver Core Club, which includes 10 million in North America wide liability insurance to ensure you are properly covered during your outdoor adventures. Time is running out. BradleySmoker.com is giving one lucky Silvercore member a brand new Pro P10 Smoker, and the winner will be announced on an upcoming podcast. Already a member and want 20% off everything Bradley has on their website for the month of July? Check our member area on the Silvercore website for your coupon code, as well as discounts on tons of other products. So I'm sitting down with Matt Stewart, Roy Kanda, and Greg Miller, and it couldn't be more timely. So today we sent out an email a couple hours ago. We've had about, I'm I'm looking, 105, we've had 105 responses so far. And essentially it was an email that went out asking people, what do they want to see from Silver Core? And a number of people are talking about hunting. And one guy came up, he said, I'm preparing to go hunting for the first time this fall a podcast discussing strategies for first time hunters would be appreciated. Thank you. So this couldn't be better because we have some new ish hunters here. So Matt, Roy, you guys got into hunting what, but a year ago, two years ago, two, two years ago. I think we're a little bit more than two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. We took a hunting course together. I wanted to get my firearms license for actually a handgun to start. I did not think about hunting until they asked us why we wanted a firearm. And Matt had said for hunting, then I just copied his answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't count the first year as hunting. That was like, I don't know, lots of crazy, st- well, not lots of crazy stuff happened, but we didn't know what we were doing. So I don't, well, you don't count the first, I don't know, two months. No, there's no. no way. We had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> we watched a lot of videos, but still we're very unsure of how to approach it and what to do and where to go. And you guys aren't your stereotypical hunters. Like when you think about Elmer Fudd out there, traipsing around with his shotgun and coveralls, um, why don't you give a little bit of just a short bio background about yourselves and uh, we can kind of get rolling. Sure. Nobody in my family was into hunting. Like I had a cousin in Alberta who was into it. My dad, he was a fisherman, but he wasn't into hunting at all. I went out once with a neighbor. I thought it was kind of cool, but I never thought about it as a kid, even as a really adult. I don't know. I just didn't come to mind. So, you know, I'm more of a business person. So, um, nobody at work does it. Like, it's just not at all. You had no family background, no... No family background. No mentor, really. No, no mentor, none at all. So, yeah, it's totally out of the norm. Like, yeah, not even my wife, nobody in her family, nobody. And Roy, how about you? Uh, Coming from an Indo-Canadian background, my dad, uncles, no one hunted. They all had firearms. They had pistols. They'd go shooting on the weekends and whatnot, and we'd see them. Weren't allowed to touch them, weren't allowed to see, like handle them, but we just saw them. Um, so there's always a fascination with firearms, but no one in our family hunting, fishing, um, tenting for us was staying at the Motel 8. Like there was, there was nothing to do with the outdoors whatsoever. So zero hunting background, um, never went out, nothing, all brand new for us. And, and Greg, now you're getting into hunting in so much as you're, you're learning from, from Matt and from Roy here. Yeah, it was just, one of those things, I think I went with these two guys when they first bought their, uh, their first rifles and, um, they went through the process at the time. I wasn't, uh, didn't have the time to take the course and, and commit to it. And then they started going out and I mean, we, we golf together, we fish together, we do a lot of activities, outdoor activities. Uh, and it was, they, they said, Hey, why don't you come and just see what it's like? I'm, I love the water. I love being on boats. I've been around boats my whole life. And so I figured, Hey, if I can go out and help to start off with and just see what it's like and, you know, if I can help with the setup or get them out there and, you know, uh, go do recoveries or so be it. And I would, I would help it where I can. So for sure, it's something I, I will finally get my license eventually. It's just a matter of trying to find the time more than, more than anything. Yeah. And for the listeners out here, we're primarily talking about waterfowl hunting 
and being out in the water. Now, had Matt, Roy, had you guys had much experience on the water or is that uh, leaning on Greg a lot here? Um, no, Matt, you got the fishing back. Yeah, I fish. So I, you know, I have a boat, so I'm used to that. So that part was fine. Um, not really in the marsh, more down the river and then, you know, out in the Gulf or whatever, but, uh, and then a bit with my dad being a fisherman too, but you know, it didn't really interest me back in the day. So it's still fairly new to me, but you know, this is where Greg comes in and he's kind of our... Make sure we do okay, things you can right. Say it. Yeah. He's our safety guy. So or Papa Bear. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, he kind of makes sure we do it right. So lights on the boat, going down the river when it's dark and stuff like that. Roy and I are more like hop in and go. So <laughs> No, it's a big deal that we've got Greg on the team there. Because we uh, when we started out and I have zero water experience. Like I go with some experienced fishermen and before we even get in the dock, they put a life jacket on me. They want to make sure that we got Canada. He's the only guy that can't swim. So for me, right. it's a big deal having guys that are into safety. Um, when Matt and I started out, we would go out in the fog and you know, we do our best. Sometimes we didn't have the lights. And when Greg found out we didn't have lights, he kind of looked at us like, what are you guys doing? Right. He, he bought left, them for us. He bought them for us. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Thank goodness he did. Because in times out there where we're like, whoa, we need those lights. It's very important. So it's for me, it's a big education thing. Um, being with someone who knows about the water, because I don't know anything about the water. Right. I'm not sure which way to go. A couple of times they've, they've been trying to teach me how to, how to drive the boat as well uh -huh. in case of emergency, which is great because I've never driven a boat before. Right. So here these guys are trying to coach me and teach me. If I didn't have them, I'd be stuck. So your first time out going out hunting, no mentors, going in blind. What'd you do? You just, you go on forums? Oh, hang tight here. So this, this is the best story. This is our first time hunting. We, we'd bought our our shotguns and we'd bought the blank rounds and fired them around the house and it was great. And then, uh, we started looking to gear. Matt and I are both gear guys. So we got gear, we got all kinds of gear. We looked pretty, really pretty. And then we yeah. picked up our, the rounds of ammo. And then we decided we need to, this is before we had a boat yeah. and we're like, we need to go, we need to get some, some ducks here. Let's go harvest some ducks. So we did some research and Matt did some research and we, we compared notes and Matt said, okay, we're going out this day. Make sure you bring your ammo, you got your gun, we're good to go. And uh, we started out and we drove down, well, it was a road down and, and uh, you drove down some road. We drove down some road. We jumped out, out of the truck and we're walking down the sidewalk. And I remember that some folks driving by looking at us and they were very scared because two guys walking down the street uh, with firearms and uh, about to jump into the marsh. So we yeah. jump into the marsh. Matt, carry on from there. Well, like highest tide of the year. So like, we're like, okay, we'll just go off into the road. We'll go down into here. We'll go our whatever, 150 meters off the road, make sure we're cool. But we couldn't see where we're stepping. The water's like up almost to our chest. We'll have our gun over our shoulder. I'm holding my box of shells. Like I didn't even have it in a bag, like, or even in a pocket. And I'm just like, <laughs> no, right? he, I'm he's, like, he's chest deep. He's chest deep with a gun in one hand and a box of <laughs> ammo in the other. Behind them is the guy that can't swim, not wearing a life vest, asking him, Hey Matt, check, check how deep it is. Let me, <laughs> let, me <know. laughs> let me know if we're going to drop. I think we're okay. I had to go first and then just stepping into a hole and I went down and I get all wet. And, and then his glove, his glove got wet, which is the glove I bought from about two sets because they were on yeah. sale. And, uh, little did we know that they weren't waterproof. So now we both have uh, cold hands. He's got a cold left hand and I've got a cold right hand because I dipped in the, in the <laughs> hole too. So then we decided that that wasn't a very good idea. Yeah, then uh, we decided we wouldn't, we couldn't get out far enough to be away from the road. So we're like, okay, this is just not going to work. And this is just a dumb idea. Like, even if it was a lower tide, I don't know. I, I still think we wouldn't have got out there anyways. So we went back up, got in the truck. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, I think there's another area we can get, you know, off the dike somewhere. So we ended up driving, you know, I don't know, 15 minutes, found a spot, parked walking down the dike. And then it was just weird because we're there. These people are walking their dogs. There's people like taking pictures of birds and there was other hunters out there, but, and it was like, by this time it was like sunny, 
you know, I don't think there's any ducks around. There's a lot of people. And I'm just like, we went out there anyways. It was a little bit weird, but, uh, and then we just kind of stood and went down and stood in the marsh. And then we're just like, there's nothing coming in. There's nothing around. There's a bunch of hunters that are all coming back in. And we're like, okay, this didn't happen today, but we learned a few things. So. Well, we were fully intimidated. We're not quite oh, yeah. sure how far we're supposed to be from other hunters. We had just come like the day before from the gun range for the first time when we tried to shoot trap and I yelled pull and I went to shoot um, the clay and my um, my lock was on. Your trigger lock? Your, your lock safety. Was on. Your safety yeah. was on. Safety, okay. And uh, yeah, that was a little embarrassing. Um, so fully green, fully intimidated, intimidated uh, haven't really shot before. And it's like, we learned a couple of things. Like maybe we shouldn't go into the marsh when it's deep and we don't know. And it's probably tide. like noon. I don't know what time it was. It was like middle of the day. Yeah. No decoys, nothing. Nothing. Not even a bag. No. Just a box a of ammo in a hand. <laughs> <laughs> and a firearm. Now, Greg, yeah. you do some work with Coast Guard. Uh, yeah, with the volunteers, uh, Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue. Do you ever come across hunters that are <laughs> yeah, for uh, sure. waiting out in the marsh? Um, yeah, I just broken down boats in the river. Okay. Um, guys go out and then, yeah, you're not able to get back because their engines won't start. Um, most of the time there's other guys out there that can bring them back, but the odd, the odd time that, uh, you can find a, find a call off Steve Sittner off Ladner. Right. For sure. And I think that's kind of why you hear the stories of these guys going out the first time and kind of. For me, it's like, okay, if I can take that stress away, because running the river is stressful, there's logs, there's debris, running it at five o'clock in the morning when there's no, you know, no navigation lights. And so if you can take that stress away to allow them just to kind of focus on the hunting side of it, right. that, that's, that's, that's where I fit in. <laughs> so it's, it's good. For now. For now. For now. For now. Yeah. So that was your first time out hunting. And an un unsuccessful hunt in so much as harvesting anything, but successful in that you learned where not to go, how not to do it. Yep. Exactly. Would you go back and you'd like read or research on the internet or talk to the gun store and try and get as many tips as possible? Like what was your tactic? I didn't really talk to anybody at the gun store because I, even there, I felt kind of intimidated. I'm like, are these, am I going to walk in here and this guy's going to think I'm a total rookie they're not going to want to, they'll be like, oh, I don't want to bother with this guy. So I, I didn't even try, to be honest. It, a lot of it was just online. And then a lot of it is you can't find very much information really about sort of what's going on here, you know, in the lower mainland. A lot of stuff is down in the States. So I'm like, is this even relevant to here? So mm. um, like I kind of figured the areas I could go, um, kind of knowing the river a bit but I didn't have a boat when we first started. So right. very quickly we realized that, you know what, we, we got to have a boat. So that was kind of one of the biggest first sort of steps, I think, into really progressing. I went to a couple of places and I asked a question or two, but I felt kind of dumb right away because yeah. these are all experts. Like, so the different stores and whatnot, and they're not trying to be mean whatsoever, yeah. but you just feel intimidated. I get feel it. like these guys know everything and I'm here trying to get into this, this new activity and I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to look like an idiot. Right. So I did what Matt did and I, and I, I found out about a few, uh, foul hunters, um, that were in the same profession. So I contacted them. Okay. So I got some good tips. One of the gents told me, make sure you get some really warm waiters, especially for your feet. Cause you're going to be cold. Okay. You go spend the extra money. Okay. Yeah. Um, then he said, well, if you need, you, you need to go out with someone who knows what they're doing. So even before we got our boat, I think, well, Matt's boat there, we went out with a couple of gents, yeah. a couple of good guys who knew what they were doing that took us out. Yeah. And that was the first time I had pulled the trigger um, at a duck. That's right. I didn't hit anything, but I gave it a go when I got to, I think the biggest thing for, for, for me was knowing the etiquette. That's huge, isn't it? What are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to do it? That was huge. It's, I just want to know the, the wrongs and the rights. Like I didn't want to mess up or offend anyone. Right. So having someone experienced to go out with, even for just the basic etiquette, made a huge difference for us. How about you, Matt? Yeah, same thing. I think that, you know, when we finally went out with somebody who knew what they were doing, you know, short period of time or one time, it was... It just, I think we felt a lot more comfortable after that. So we're like, okay, I, you know, we know what to do. I mean, one of the biggest things was like, when do I shoot that duck? 
because never doing it before, you're like, okay, how close do they have to be? And, you know, okay, it's 25 yards, but this is the first time you're doing it. This duck's coming in, you're getting all excited and you take a shot at, and then you realize after like, well, that thing was like way too far away. Like, so you're just wasting ammo. So Matt's still a sky blaster. That, (laughs) like, that was a big thing. It's like, how close does it have to come in? And then, you know, if you shoot it, well, how are you going to retrieve it? Right. That's another part. Like, are you going to be able to get it or not? So, you know, those are some big things. So going out with somebody just that one time was a big deal. So. I think I agree with you. That first time was a huge deal for us. It, uh, it gave us a lot of confidence and just knowing just the basic stuff of what's right and wrong. So then we were ready to go off our, on our own on the boat and learn some different things. Yeah, I think pretty soon after that is when we got a boat. So that kind of turned things around, the just, start of it anyways. Just went full into it. Got all the cool guy kit, then the boat. Yeah, what? I got a boat, camoed it up. It was a bit too shiny aluminum for us. And then uh, it kind of started from there. And then I think we ended up having like waiter's jacket, hat, gloves. I think we sort of figured that out. And then it was kind of figuring out where to go and then... And then getting beached a couple of times. Yeah. You don't want to get beached. No, no. We yeah, it's a sat, bit of work, we isn't sat it? out there at one point. We thought, oh, we're good. We're good. And I got a new shotgun and I was just trying to clear it out a bit and get it used to uh, in my hands and whatnot. And then we're looking at the boat there and Matt's like, oh, we're good. We're good. And then we were beached. Yeah. The tide went out. We came in on a pretty high tide hunting, sitting there. I'm like, ah, oh, the boat's in a bit of mud. We'll be able to get it out. And then, no. It's get, like quicksand. So quicksand. what'd you do? Well, we dragged that. I think we dragged it probably a hundred yards across the mud. Probably took us an hour sinking in. It's not mud, one, it's quicksand. One foot at a time. <laughs> um, we finally got it to some water in like a little slough but it was like, I don't know, six inches deep. So then you're walking down the slough out towards the river, gets a bit deeper. Roy can't swim. So he's like, uh, you know, he's kind of freaking out. You know, I'm like, get in the boat. I'm going to push you down. The I got in the boat really quick, <laughs> really quick. Yeah. I, I take it Greg was in there to uh, help with the tides. No, Greg was not there at the time. So he probably would have been watching a lot more careful than we were. Had so. Greg been there, we would not have been on that adventure. No, we wouldn't. No, he would have made sure that we were back in the boat. You wouldn't have had the stories though. True. <laughs> That's a good point. Well, yes. Good we, we learned. So at that point we learned that, you know what? Don't wait so long. Another time we were out there and, uh, our engine failed. We had just started. Yeah. We were good. Now we had learned to go out at sunrise, right? Like we're ready. Yeah, early one, early. We're a little bit smart now. We're going to go early. Now we've got a couple of decoys. Right. So now we progressed. We've got a few decoys now. So we're going to go out early. So we're there. We're ready. We're on the boat and we're going out. And halfway there, the motor dies. It's dead. We try, we try. Matt's ticked off. So we, we kind of beach the boat to the side and try hunting from this area. No luck. Gave it a go. Now I'm like, Matt, we got to go, bud. My wife's waiting. We got to go to soccer practice or something like that. He's like, okay, let's go. So we've decided that we're going to get back to shore, but we don't have oars. What do we have, Matt? Oh, it was a collapsible paddle. A collapsible (laughs) paddle. (laughs) It was a, yes. No lights, no oars. So no oars, no lights. We've got a collapsible paddle, but you know, we're, we're giving it a go. We're trying to get back. It's not too far and it's not working. So we decided to take a little bit of a shortcut. So we have this little canal we're going to go through. And of course, Matt lets me sit in the boat like a king because I can't swim. And he is dragging the boat uh, through the marsh there and uh, the canal dries up. So now we're not happy because we have zero ducks. It's not been a pleasant experience so far. Thank goodness it's not raining. But he's like, Roy, here's what we're going to do, buddy. We're going to take the boat and we're going to carry it over 15, 20 feet across this this piece of land here. And we're back. We're back in the back river. Back the river. We're, we're good to go. Yeah. I thought, okay, I can do that. So I'm at the front and he's pushing the boat and I'm pulling the boat and we're going over some land here and it's like a push pull and it's that quicksand and a couple pulls in. I say, Matt, come up here. And I could hear it in his voice. Kanda, 
what's the problem? I can hear him saying, listen, you weak Indo-Canadian guy who can't swim. What is your problem? <laughs> Why can't you just pull the boat? Let's go. And they'll come over, buddy. So he comes up and he sees what I see. And we discover our body. It is the craziest thing I've ever experienced in my life. Here we are in the marsh, pulling a boat across the land, and then boom, there's the body. So he looks at me, he's like, oh, okay, you weren't, you weren't kidding around. This is mm. serious. This is serious. So we both look at each other and it's kind of like, you know, it's like, whoa, this is crazy. Um, we better call someone here. So we made a couple of phone calls to our wives first, tell them that we might be a little bit late. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we made the call to the, or did you make the call to our Did I? I think you did. Uh, you did. You made the first call and then you didn't know where we were. So then I passed the phone then to him. Then he passed the phone to me and then you got <laughs> you to describe where you are and... Then they're like, well, there's no land there. I'm like, well, they're standing on land. It's a marsh. But yeah, that was, that was interesting. So then they, they came on down. But uh, the best part is when the RCMP came on down, we could see land from where we were. And the RCMP could see us, but they couldn't get across to where we were. So Matt and I had to walk the boat to the RCMP, let them jump on the boat, and then drag them back. There were three of them. Yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty big deal for him. Yeah, and then the tide started to come in. The so tide started to come in, yeah. and as the RCMP and the Coast Guard are going back and forth about the body, right? Matt and I uh, flagged down this uh, this uh, young buck. Must have been in his seventies. Yeah. So we flag him down. <laughs> he's got his boat coming. He's he's a, he's a hunter, and we we yelled him, "We need help, bud. We got the RCMP here. We got a body here." Our boat's dead. We got to be towed back. So the best part is he's trying to uh, unload his firearm as his uh, boat's spinning. And he finally comes over and he jumps on land. He goes straight to the RCMP officer and asks what's going on. And he wants to go see the body. They're like, fine, go see the body. Don't touch it. And, and we have this female RCMP officer that's uh, interviewing us. And Matt and I are, are serious and whatnot. And uh, Grandpa just, just uh, drops his waiters. Drops his waiters and he, cause he needed to relieve himself. So <laughs> the female. Hold, hold on a second. Number one or number two? <laughs> He's just going, number one. Number one. <laughs> and I'm, think, I'm looking at Matt. I'm looking at the female RCMP officer and grandpa's uh, just, he has to relieve himself and he just turns around and we just kind of shrugged our shoulders. We got to watch the RCMP do a full search and see how they want run protocol. And, uh, and then the coolest thing was when that, uh, the Coast Guard came in, eh, Matt? The hovercraft, yeah, came in and had to, they had to take the body away. I mean, the tide was coming in. It was like, well, I don't know, it was like six inches deep there by the time they didn't realize. I'm like, okay, I think we got about half an hour here and like the, the water's going to be up. So like, right. well, you gotta, you gotta figure out what you're going to do here. So they kind of panicked and then they had to call the Coast Guard in. So that was quite the scene too. So no kidding. Well, the best yeah. part is we called Greg and Greg's like the one time I can't come. The one time I can't come, you guys find a body. What is going on here? Because yeah. he was all over. I'm sure you, you were oh, watching yeah. your radio, weren't you? You yeah, were checking was, out everything. It was my wife's birthday that day, so I didn't think it was a wise move to go and got the, got the text message. I'm like, really? Are you guys, is this serious? And then watch the hovercraft get tasked. And That's a hell of a new hunting adventure. I, I don't think too many people, new hunters, go out there and happen to find bodies. Just no. floating? Not it was there for a thing. while. It must have been there was, for a while. It's there for a while. And, and yeah. the RCMP said that this most likely they wouldn't have found it. Right. Right. Unless someone had got stuck there because no one would ever go over that little piece of land. Mm. Well, we shouldn't have been there. I mean, the motor yeah. broke down. We're pulling the boat, you know, down the river, essentially. You are you were walking like on the shore. I was kind of pushing it on the side. And we, j we shouldn't have been there. Like nobody would stop there. So Man. it's just crazy. So heck yeah. of a story though. Yeah, it's one of those things that'll stick with you for a while. Yeah, for sure. Uh, people like don't believe me when I tell them. Like they're just like, "What? Like really? That happened?" I'm like, "Yeah." Well, happened. the be the best part was that the RCMP and the hovercraft left us there as they as they went on their way, and uh, Grandpa was uh, towing us back to shore. I don't know <laughs> if he's doing donuts or whatnot, but he left us 
about 100 yards from shore. He just dropped the rope. Yeah, he just dropped the rope. And, and we're like, oh. so we just paddled our way back in. <laughs> well, well, he was even. a seasoned veteran, that gentleman. At least he pulled <laughs> us most of the way. So. I think the best part was when we were stranded on the island there, he was like, hey, Roy, can you call my wife for me? Because she's expecting me, like, you know, right now. And if I don't come home, I think she thinks I'm dead. I'm like, oh, sure, <laughs> sure. But you dial the phone. I can't dial it. I can't dial it. You dial it. And then I'll talk to her. Oh, man. Yeah, that was interesting. Oh, he was a beaut. So, yeah. Have you seen him since? No, I think he lived in Vancouver okay. and he, yeah, he was in his seventies for sure. Oh, yeah. we helped him. We put his boat back on his truck. I don't know how he got the boat off. He had it in the back of his truck. So we had to put it back in this truck for him. So this 70 year old guy just lifted yeah. this thing out. And I think he lived somewhere like deep in Vancouver. Like, so he just came Hardcore. out here to go hunting. Oh, he was he's, a beaut. He was, he, he loved going I out. I think he said he's been coming out here for like 30, 40 years. Yeah. So yeah. So crazy. So at this point in your hunting career, success rate when you're going out, high, low, like how far are we pretty, into it? Pretty low. That was what, a year in maybe? Oh, we were low success rate at that time. I think, uh, I, yeah, I think the odd duck here and there. When Greg came out, when Greg started coming out with us, we started getting more duck. That's why, that's right. Because he'd say, because uh, when, whenever we didn't go out with Greg, we'd come back skunked. Right. And then uh, when we went out with Greg, we'd have a few. So he's, he's the lucky charm. He was a lucky charm. So if we ever went out without him, we'd get skunked. Right. I think it was the extra decoys and everything else that you uh, purchased between then and now. Well, extra decoys and oars. Oars was a big one. Yeah. We picked up oars. We've got a first, uh, we've got a full on first aid kit. Um, and we even threw in some, um, what's it called? Benadryl. Okay. Because we heard stories of some other hunters going out, having allergic reactions and you're stuck out there. Hmm. Right. So if you're having an allergic reaction, what are you going to do? Yeah. So now in, in that uh, first day kit, we've, we've put some Benadryl. We've got, I get migraines. So I have Advil and Tylenol in there. Yeah. Water. Um, water. Yeah. yeah we've water. got water in there. We just got smarter. We tried to minimalize what we have on the boat now. Like I, I started off with a, a uh, really cool bag yeah. from uh, Bass Pro or wherever it was. And it was like, it was the coolest bag ever. But when I took it out in the marsh, even though it was a floating bag, it was fully soaked. Really? So I bought a bag that was maybe 60% less, but it's a full on dry bag. Everything goes in one bag now. Minimal. Everything is minimal. Not fancy, just minimal. And that's the way to do it too. Like. Any, any yeah. new hobby you get into, it's all accumulation of knowledge, accumulation of kit, everything else. And at some point you start realizing how little you actually need to go out and be successful. What does your loadout look like now compared to when you first started? We probably have half the stuff. I mean, we have some more decoys now, but other than that, I think it's like the bare minimum. I bring like, I don't know, we have water that stays in the boat and the tote in the boat. I think I do a power bar, ammo, second pair of gloves, and that's probably about it, I'd say. I'm the exact same. I, ammo, a snack, um, extra gloves always. I learned that quick. Yeah. Bring those yeah. extra gloves, especially when it's you, you try to retrieve something and your whole hand is wet. Yeah. Um, that's why we bought Greg some uh, decoy gloves. Poor guy who had freezing hands the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, very minimal. And that one pack, we pack everything. So each guy's got one pack he brings. Yep. We have the yep. decoys, uh, the first aid kits in the boat. Um, I think that's it, Greg. What yeah. else do you bring? No, I think that's pretty much it. We each have our own dry bag, life jacket, obviously. And uh, gloves is gives the key. I bring a VHF radio usually. Uh, I think we have one on the boat now that we, we yep. leave as well. But uh um, yeah, minimal, it's, you just want to have everything with you. So you don't want to be carrying around a lot of stuff, I think is what we found and, um, keep, keep dry and warm, stay out there longer. Less it, stuff in the boat too. Yeah, yeah. Especially when we're coming on and off the boat, we're actually, we're, we're very safety conscious. Like I'm not getting into the boat without handing Matt or Greg my firearm first. Right. I'm just, why not? Give, you know, the same thing goes for all of us. We just go very slowly, take our time, do it the right way. And that's key. It really yeah. is. You only got to make a mistake once. Yeah. Well, that's, we, we're, we're also, we always like to drink the three of us, but we don't drink when we hunt. Right. That's just a rule we have. We drink when we golf. Sure. We drink at each other's homes. Sure. We don't drink when we hunt. 
I think that's a smart rule. We, I know some people will. Yeah. And yeah. teach their own, but yeah. we will have a drink after. Sure. Like we normally pull up to my garage and we'll go in my garage and sit there and, and, and either be happy that we, we, we harvest some ducks or like, oh, we better get some next time and we'll enjoy it then for sure. But uh, there's too many things that can go wrong when you're out in the marsh, especially for me as a non-swimmer. I I did invest in an automatic life vest. Right. One, it's slimmer, so it's easier to maneuver. Uh, and two, anything can happen there. I've fallen a couple of times out there or, or have lost my step. And that sand can really grab you. Yeah, it really can. It can grab you quick. And even in the marsh, you're walking around. There's all kinds of dips there. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going for a little walk on my own, I throw I throw my um my life vest on. Right. Yeah. Anytime I'm jumping on the boat or off the boat, it's, I've got it on for sure. Or I've got it beside me when I'm on the marsh. Um, we don't mess around that way. No, that's smart. I think my first time out with you guys, you got out of the boat and then I went to get out and I was pulling the boat up and took a step too far and whoosh. And you're in. And I went. Yeah. It was up, probably up to my, uh, just under my armpits, I think. You're going with so, chest waders as well? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I originally was kind of, you know, as they experienced and upgrade their equipment that I would, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hand me down. I would take their hand-me-downs and, Perfect. uh, but I've obviously now purchased my own stuff uh, yeah. as well, but uh, I think I still got the original waiter hand-me-downs that I picked up off these guys. And, uh, so yeah, you don't realize, you know, you really got to watch your footing cause it can happen quickly. And of course they're, they've got their backs to me as they're walking to, to get set up and, you know, you're all of a sudden in the water and, uh, luckily the boat was there and I was able to grab it and kind of embarrassed over that. I think I did admit <laughs> to it, but a little embarrassed. Well, you're out there helping set up the decoys. Yep. You're helping in the blind or you're helping set up wherever you're going to be, uh, be hunting and the retrieval. I, yeah, I do the retrieval well. So I, I think that we're kind of creatures of habit, all, all three of us. So we kind of go to the same, the same spot and we know our, our setup on, um, we do a little bit experimenting in other areas, but we, we kind of have our favorite spot. So we'll get to the, get to the, the place we take our boat normally. And the two of them will jump off when we've got land decoys as well as the blind and, and then I'll go back and start uh, deploying the, the water decoys. And so they'll be on the shore kind of guiding where we, where we want them to go. And then once it's set up, then I can kind of bring the boat around again and kind of all sit back and admire what we've done. And if it's going to work this time, or if it's not going to work, it's. You know, I think we've, uh, changed the, the setup quite a few times and you add, add the robos here and there and, uh, add more decoys, but, uh, I think we've got it pretty much down now pretty good. And, and then if, um, if they're successful and, and they nail one, then I'll go jump in the boat and I'll go and, and do the recovery. And that way, again, they can kind of focus just on watching what's around and seeing what's going on They're They're obviously very cautious of the fact that I'm recovering right. uh, in front and, but once I get it and I'm far enough away, then if another Back clock comes, they, they can go back at it. Right? right. Um, and there's been times where I just kind of hunker down the boat and, um, and if they're going to get another one, then it, I don't have to go back, but, uh, um, yeah, so, and we're pretty successful in recovery. So it's been good. So are you researching as well? Are you looking up like how to set up the decoys and. Uh, I think we have kind of enough conversations about it. I've for sure looked online. I've, I've looked on sign a line on calling. Um, that was, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> so I think we've all done that. He likes to duck um, call for sure. Yeah. I don't know if my, Matt's for sure the best duck caller we have. Uh, if you've probably seen me in rush hour traffic on the way home from work, I'll be sitting in my car practicing <laughs> my duck calling. <laughs> um, it, it's definitely something that takes a while to master. And, uh, we all, I, I think Canada at one point said, Greg, you're scaring him away. Just stop, stop. You're scaring him away. Um, so we all kind of have our strengths and duck calling right now is not mine for sure. I think that's, uh, that's Matt's. I think I've got about seven or eight duck calls because I blame it on the duck call more than the, <laughs> the caller. Just like golf clubs, right? Exactly. Golf clubs. Exactly. It's the new bag of God. That's why I'm I not shooting very well. calling hard. Like, I'm like, you look at it online and these guys make it look so easy and, and this is how I do it and this is what you should do. And I don't know. I, I guess you got to practice a lot, but I just, I'm like, okay, when do I call them in? When do I don't? Am I doing it right? Am I scaring them away? So... I don't know. It's, it's difficult. I but I think hard. there's a couple cases where you've actually called them in, which is more than I think me and Roy can say, where we've been sitting there, we see them circling over and then you do the call and you definitely see them make that turn and, and come towards us, which, you know. You know what kind of day it's been when Matt's calling. If he's calling really hard, we're pretty dry. Yeah. <laughs> he, he wants those bad. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know what? The one thing we've learned too, for sure is, and I wasn't a believer at first, it's all about the blind. I thought, no, we're good. We're good. They can't see us. Matt's like, they can see us. They can see us. I'm like, who cares if they see us? We're not moving. And I didn't think it was that big of a deal. 
But uh, the better we got at it, and the better our blind was, the more successful we were. Right. It was, it, I was like, really? Is it that big of a deal, bud? You're going overkill, Matt. You've got this coming in. You're ordering from this place. <laughs> but no, it, it really is a big deal. The blind is a huge part of everything. That was a big thing for us. Big turning point was them. Because when we first went out, we were just like kind of sitting there in the reeds. Like we, I don't know. We sat there mostly in two stools. exposed. We had yeah. two stools, two stools, just sitting there. Sit and, there. Well, we, at first we didn't have a stool. We're crouching down. Yes, but then we, so we got stools and we got bags. We yeah, were progressing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you go. Full on stools. You don't have the bird bucket. You turn it upside down. You sit on it. Turn it out the other way and bring your birds out. Oh, that's bird a good bucket. Idea. Ah. We just have these little collapsible stools that just throw in the boat and don't take up a lot of room. So. Yeah. Every guy's got got his job when we go out there. It's it's, it's very yeah. systematic. You know, these guys are driving out till we get there. They, we, I jump off to, to launch the robos. Matt and Greg have got the other decoys going. Once that's set up, we, we sit and we wait together and it, it's very systematic. And half the time we don't even talk. It's just, it's, it's so serene out there. Like for me, everybody that knows me would never have imagined that I'd be a duck hunter. Yeah. No. I love being out with these guys. It's it's brilliant. It's the best time ever. It's something new. It's just, it's, I can't explain it. It's, it's brilliant. How would you compare it to golf? Ooh. Because okay. I, I know you're quite into golf. Yeah, I'm a hardcore golfer. So last year, I'll put it this way, it was a uh, duck hunting season. And uh, I was going out with the boys here. And my brother called me. He goes, I got a tea time at Mayfair Lakes. And I love Mayfair Lakes. It's my course to play at. And I said, sorry, bud. I'm hunting tomorrow. It's hunting season. So now it's either hunting season or it's golfing season. There are, they're fully even for me. Really? I have two seasons. It's hunting season or it's golfing season. If I'm hunting, golfing doesn't matter. Are you a competitive golfer? No. Let's go out and have a good <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the next question where I'm going with that is hunting. Is that a sort of competitive thing with you guys? When you go out, it's like, oh no, they're coming over. Matt's no. going to get it. It better be mine. No, no Zero. I don't think so. It, it, for us, so good, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I don't see that at all. And, you know, Roy's a pretty competitive guy. I don't think we play around a golf where there isn't money of some sort involved in it. <laughs> um, but not with, uh, not with hunting. They, I mean, they have their systems, they have their stances, they, they know, you know, which, whose, whose duck it is depending on what side it's coming from, but, uh, there's no competitive. I mean, sure. Afterwards it's nice to say, oh, I got three, I got two. Um, but there's no competitiveness during the actual hunting. Yeah, it's, it's a team effort for sure when we're out there. Set up and then, yeah. If if there's one duck that's harvested, it doesn't matter who got it because we're going to split it. Yeah. Three ways. Right. So it's all about, like, if I'm having a bad shooting day and Matt brings down half a dozen, well, I got two coming my way for dinner. That's great. Yeah. No, it's all about what comes to the boat. Yeah. It's never, I want these guys to do well. That is the best way to do it. It's a team. It's how many can, we, so Matt and I play a game. So we have different goals we want to hit, right? So, okay, Roy has to do a double header. We got two going, coming in, we got to go boom, boom. Uh, Roy, um, let's see how many we can take while we're, you know, we, we cut the engine on the water and, and take one down as we're in the boat. Um, it's more of a team game. Right. How many can we bring down together? That's what we're going for. It's worked out well so far. So we share... We share the ducks and yeah. And we're always we're, discussing ways to improve, right? I don't think we've always. gone out on a trip where we've come back and said, we were happy with the way it was set up or we were happy with what, I think we've improved something almost every, even if it comes to the weights on the, the decoys, right? I mean, we kept on losing the decoys because of the, the river current and all of a sudden right. they'd be floating away and we have to go and chase them and, and we got to buy bigger weights now. And then you got a big bigger blind and there's always improvements. I think that, uh, I don't know if we're ever going to be happy with, <laughs> with the setup. <laughs> well, Matt, especially, yeah, we when we got, adjust, always. especially when there's gear guys in the table. Yeah. yeah earlier, Matt, you're talking about something with your, your decoys, your floating decoys. You have a, a different system now that you're, you're trying with them. Yeah. I think the first we had line and a J weight, Yeah. right? So you'd adjust, okay, I think it's this deep here and it's dark too, right? So, and then you, you put them down Tide comes up, they sort of float away. You got to, you go out and get them. Mm -hmm. And they're just a pain to kind of retrieve. So I think it's called a, a Texas rig, I think is what it's called. So it's got like a a certain length line. I think we use like a 10 foot line. Mm -hmm. It's got like a mushroom weight on there. 
and it's this kind of nylon coated wire, I think is what right. it is. Right. And then you just kind of hook them on this carabiner and then you just kind of grab them all at once. So they don't really tangle up. Nope. You just unhook the carabiner. You just toss them out where you want them. And then when we retrieve them, you just hook the carabiner on and you just drag them all up and pull them into the boat. So that's, that's been good. I think it's been way better. Yeah. Way quicker uh, deploying them and recovering. And then you can also yeah. deploy them from shore. We've done a couple of times. Yeah. You just throw them you off. The J weights was just, uh, it was just hard. It was a pain. Big tangled, tangled mess. Yeah, yeah. Tangled mess. Exactly. Yeah. And then the current, they drag and then they drift into each other. And it's just, yeah. You're guessing exactly how long you want the line out. And yeah. If you miss it, then yeah, you're chasing decoys all after all, all morning as we're ending. Yeah. Yes. Not fun. No. <laughs> I'll have to put a link to that in the podcast notes so the listeners can check out what that looks like. Yeah. And you can get like, uh, I think it's popular down the States and they're hunting on these like shallow ponds. So you get like a three foot or four foot ones and 10 feet are pretty long, but right. we kind of need them here, but it, it works well. I like it. So. So you're a couple of years into it now. If you were to turn around and try and give some advice to beginning you, what would you guys say? Safety. Okay. That's my first thing right there, especially for someone like me. Like what I did the first time we went out and going into the marsh without a life vest, that's, that's just dumb. Yeah. No, for anyone, not just, not just me, a non-swimmer. I think for anyone, because you could, we could have fallen off and gone deep there and you're holding a box of ammo and a firearm and you're trying to protect this gun you just bought that's so expensive and you don't want to go down. Um, even with boat safety for us too, we weren't the smartest when we started. Thank God, Greg came along. We got lights and oars now. Uh, for sure, for me, one of the biggest things is safety. Even like, I love the way we handle our firearms when we're out there. I love the way we pass our firearms on the boat. I love that we don't drink. Those are big things for me because right. I've got two daughters at home and a wife and uh, I got too much to to live for to to be silly about it. Yeah, I think um, if we could ask somebody some advice or gone out, like almost like a mentor, you know, I think now looking back, I probably would ask these questions to these people who are experienced, you know, because not that I'm super experienced, but if somebody who's new to it came and asked me, I would have no problem like telling them, I might not tell them where to go exactly, but I'm going <laughs> right. to tell them what to do and maybe what not to do and how I got into it. I think that would be the biggest thing for me is I would just ask more questions on what to do and yeah, try and go out with somebody who knows what they're doing even right. once or twice. So but how, do, how do people find that? I don't know. I just think you... You just got to be brave enough to ask the guy at the local store or, um, I don't know, it might be more intimidating to just walk up to somebody who's out at the boat launch, but, uh, it, it'd be, I don't know, that, that's hard. It'd be nice if there was some kind of program or something like, I don't know, it, it's hard, but. Yeah, I think it definitely, I think that if there was a facility that would offer programs for first time hunters, mm. it would do extremely well. Mm. I think any place that say, hey, we're looking for first time hunters. We want to take you out. We'll show you, how, you know, the do's and don'ts and the etiquette and, and different things. I think that'd make a huge difference. I would sign up for a course like that in a heartbeat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they have to tread a pretty careful line on that because yeah. then the guide outfitters get involved and are you guiding or are you yeah. teaching or. Yeah. So it's, I, I think that's part of the reason why we don't see too many of those out yeah. there. Even if you didn't hunt, but they just sort of show you like, you know, what you should and shouldn't do, even just showing you that kind of thing, not, not just sitting in the blind and actually hunting for the ducks, but just some basic stuff. Like how do you set decoys? How do you put them out? Like, even if you're not hunting from, but just, this is how you sort of do it. Just an idea, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to give all your tricks away to these people, but some idea would be good. You know, this is kind of this is how ducks fly in, or this is what they do. You know what I mean? Like the behaviors and stuff like that. Little things like that would be very helpful. Cool. So, but I just, I don't know where you get that. You gain that knowledge, I guess, but. From if you, if grandpa you, YouTube? There you go. <laughs> and that's where most people are getting it from. Yeah. How yeah, about you, Greg? We've had a lot of discussions on Friday nights over the odd uh, beverage talking about what we're going to improve on or what we can look up and yeah. try to try to do better. Um, I think just. I mean, so I'm, I'm not actually doing the hunting side of it, but I think it's, if you, I mean, the safety for sure. We kind of are. Everything other than pulling well, the trigger. Well, everything other than pulling trigger for sure. And um, I, I think it's just taking your time 
is the big thing. You can't rush into anything. You got to make sure you got the right spot and you got the right setup. And, uh, um, you know, if you're not ready and they're, they're flying over, you got to just take your time. And even, even when they are coming in, these guys sometimes get a little anxious and it's easy for me to criticize because I'm not the <laughs> one with the firearm or pulling the trigger, but, uh, you know, I'll sit back and watch and see this come in and I'm like, okay, they're, they're, they're going to land and all of a sudden boom, 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 boom. And they all fly over and it's like, oh, you could have waited a little longer, but I, I, I get the anticipation and the, you know, the, the want to, to take them down right away. Right. So, right. Uh, uh, so I think with, with just, it's a, it's a sport somewhat like uh, fishing where you just need to have the patience and you're not going to be successful every time you go out. And I think that's part of the attraction for me is, you know, going out and see how successful we can be every time. Totally. If it was easy. Absolutely. There'd be no, it, it wouldn't hold that same appeal. Yeah. If that learning curve wasn't there, if you weren't always constantly learning something new every time you went yeah. out. Yeah, for I sure. Agree. I think this gives a good sort of intro for new people kind of getting into it. Yeah. A few adventures, a few stories, but. Yeah. And definitely, you know, starting at the beginning, going to the gun club to get comfortable with your firearm. Yeah. It was a big thing. Was that intimidating? hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. From a guy who thinks he's all tough and yeah, it was very, very intimidating. Yeah. Uh, very intimidating just being at the gun club. Didn't want to do the wrong thing. Right. So being able to handle your firearm, knowing how to take your firearm apart and put it back together again, also mm. very important. Yes. Uh, knowing how to clean it, also very important. Before you go out hunting, right. knowing how to do those things. I think it's a big deal. Yeah. Being comfortable shooting your gun was a big thing. Like I think the first time we went and did trap and we didn't know the etiquette. I think we, I kind of looked it up online. We kind of went there. We stood back for probably a good half an hour, kind of just watched sort of what was going on and be like, okay, I think we got this. And then, you know, I, up, I asked a guy, there. yeah, I asked a and guy. And you asked the uh, asked older a, gentleman there. No, yeah. I asked the younger guy. I, the older guys later, I asked the younger guy and this young guy was great. Yeah. He's like, bud, watch your muzzle. Uh, do this, only one in the chamber, don't close it. He was great because I was nervous. I was like, oh my God, I'm so nervous, so nervous. Um, so he was very helpful. And then poor Maddie over here got one stuck. <laughs> and then he was trying to get it out. That's when the old guy gave you a hard time. Yeah, watch, I was trying to get it out. Of, it was stuck in there. He's just, hey, just watch where you're pointing your gun or whatever. And rightfully so. Like, sure. I don't think it was anything dangerous, but no. he just said, hey, just watch watch your direction there. And and that was good. That was, it was the, good. Yeah, called me out. But he was, he was good. He sort of explained, you know, I'll be at the start here and this is how it's going to work. We go down the line of five and each one takes one shot. So after that, once we got comfortable, it it was way better. Like that yes. for after that first time, I felt way more comfortable for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did you have a lot of people over your shoulder trying to give advice? Um, not really there. There was a, a gentleman who worked there. He's like, I think you're a little bit high. Those guns shoot high. And I'm like, okay, I don't know. I, I didn't really pay attention to him, but when we were there, nobody really tried to give too much advice to be honest. So. Just uh, watch your muzzle. Watch your yeah, muzzle. Well, yeah. Which is, you know, <laughs> you should do, but. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Nobody really tried to give us any advice on what we were doing wrong. I was holding my gun in the wrong place. Like I learned that I had a huge bruise on my shoulder. I'm like, I was way too low. So I knew I wasn't hitting anything, but I mean, that was learning experience. I didn't do that ever again. So. Right. Um, but the yeah. feeling when you hit your first clay target. Oh yeah. Oh, magic. Magic. Just Almost some, as good as when you harvest your first yeah. duck. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty cool. I love it. Yeah. Well guys, thank you very much for being on the, on the show and for sharing your experiences. That's uh Definitely encouraging for other people out there to know that it is intimidating. Like I, I was raised around firearms. I've been going to the ranges ever since I've been a wee one and I've got a little bit different perspective, but somebody just brand new getting into it. That's a lot to take in. Yeah, for sure. Thanks very much guys. That's yeah. a good time. Thanks for having yeah, us. Yeah. Thanks for having us Thank for you. sure. Mm -hmm.